This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast, bringing you a special interview with former Bengals defensive back and current NFL media member, Solomon Wilcott. Solomon, it's uh, our distinct pleasure to have you on the program. How are you doing, sir? Anthony, I'm doing great, and uh, I'm glad to be on with you today. Yeah, and you are coming to us courtesy of Pro Football Focus. We have actually had a couple of folks associated with PFF uh, on our program previously, so uh, it's great to have a high-profile person like yourself within the organization. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, I know our listeners know quite a bit about PFF, but uh, I know you're trying to bring awareness to the site. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great company, as you well know. It's owned uh, by former Cincinnati Bengal Chris Collinsworth a former teammate of mine, and it's just a wonderful company. The work that we do and all the data analysts out there who are collecting the data to grade every single player on every single play, not just in the NFL, but in college football as well, um, where we can give grades on players who are entering the 2020 draft, uh, players who have been in the league uh, for a long time. We have um, great information that um, lends itself to just really enjoying the game at a whole nother level, understanding the game at an entirely different level. You can find our products by going to pff.com. We have great articles there uh, where you can read. We believe that our data is predictive. So um, if you learn to use it, you can be, uh, you can mesmerize your friends, whether it's in fantasy, <laughs> uh, whether it's in gaming, or just at a party, you know who's going to win, you know who's going to be productive. Uh, it can be a lot of fun learning new things. Yeah, we've had Evan McPhillips, the local uh, kind of Bengals coverage guy for PFF, as well as Austin Gale. We spoke to him on this program, too. So it's great to have you with us. And PFF is a big part of our, you know, we, we reference that quite a bit on this show. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. I kind of want to get your state. I mean, you've been, uh, obviously, you've been at the national level in terms of the NFL landscape media-wise. You've been working directly with the Cincinnati Bengals. I think this last uh, last preseason, you were one of the sideline guys for the game. So you have an intimate knowledge of the team, obviously playing there. Where do you, I mean, teams coming off a 2-14 and 14 finish, tied for the worst record they've ever had in a season. Big overhaul last offseason. Looks like the same is going to be had, just not at the coaching level, more at the quarterback and other levels. How do you How do you gauge the current status of the Bengals right now? You know, I, I think they, I think people just take shots at an organization that, yes, yeah, they had some down times in the 90s and the early 2000s, but it's been, it's been about a 16-year run where this team has been sort of, you know, a little bit up and down, but certainly not at the bottom. And I think people take some shots because they're coming off this bad season. They end up with this first overall pick, but now they're going to inherit one of the great college players to come out uh, of college and enter the draft, um, and, uh, and I think in the 150 year history of college football, I think what Joe Burrow did in 2019 has caught the imagination of the entire country. And it, so, for the Bengals, how dare the day and stuff with the great Joe Burrow? But if you go back and look at the last decade, Bengals went to the playoffs five straight years, five of those kids that they were in the playoffs. And so, there's other teams that are certainly sitting on the bottom end of the 32 teams in the National Football League. The Bengals aren't one of them. And I think they bounce back and they begin to trend upward. Um, we just got to get an offensive line in front of Joe Burrow. And I think that's where the team really has struggled. And I think it's hurt their ability to go out and perform on a consistent basis. Yeah, continuing to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, this this narrative that, that kind of floated out there from various media outlets, national media outlets about, you know, Burrow may not play for the Bengals. And even when he kind of put those to bed a little bit, especially at the Combine, um, you know, people are still kind of running with it. You kind of were a little bit outspoken saying, hey, look, you know, there, there have been some shortcomings. I think that this kid can still win in Cincinnati despite some of the criticisms and whatnot. Uh, is that because you feel that he is that special of a player? Or do you think the organization is finally kind of turning to some more modern practices away from, you know, some of the some of the other things where these narratives have stemmed from? Well, I, I first of all, I think that the narratives have fallen. I think they have been wrongly cast um, as a team that doesn't want to win a Super Bowl. Of course they want to win a Super Bowl. You know, I play 
eighth year when we went to a Super Bowl. The same general manager that was running the team then uh, that allowed the team to draft well enough to go to the Super Bowl twice in one decade, he's still drafting players. This is the same general manager with the same people um, at, at Duke Tobin who drafted the likes of after Carson and Chad were gone. The very next year, they drafted A.J. Green and Andy Dalton in the same draft, one and two. And then they go out and get Carlos Dunlap and Geno Atkins. Then they get Muhammad Shadu and Marvin Jones. And then they get a Tyler Eifert. I mean, and it's just one after another. Um, and Andrew Whitworth. How, I remember 2015, wasn't that long ago, the Bengals had one of the best rosters, the most talented rosters in the National Football League. So I know that the narrative is false, that they don't want to win, or that maybe they don't know what they're doing. There's nothing to be further from the truth. So I wanted to shoot that down first, but I also believe in Joe Burrow. I watched every single game that he played in 2019. I've I watched him beat seven top 10 ranked teams go through a gauntlet of really top 10 defenses where he made them look like child's play. He shredded the Oklahoma Sooners secondary for eight touchdown passes. And yes, he's playing with good players around him, but he's playing in a pro-style offense. Worked with Joe Brady, he's sat with uh, Drew Brees and learned some things from him. So his ball placement is impeccable. He performs well under pressure. Throws the ball with great accuracy, and he's a competitor, which is what I really love the most about him. You saw how he was body rocked early in the game against Clemson. He got up, dusted himself off, and kept swinging it, and ended up winning that game going away. Now, I don't think anyone would want a quarterback like that. I've seen him do things that are not just impressive, they're very impressive. It's top notch. And so, those are the things that I'm seeing, and I, I listen, I think a lot of the other people see it too. And they're just hoping the Bengals would trade away their pick. They're just hoping somehow maybe Joe Burrow won't want to go there. How can we? This happens every year in the draft. How can we shake that tree and maybe some good players will fall to us? That, that's what you're seeing. That's why you're getting these narratives. You know, this is Pinocchio time. Everyone's telling stories. We know they're not true, but they're trying to make sure that great players fall in the draft. It happened to Randy Moss. It happened to what well, happened to Warren Sass, happened to some really good players. They stuff that how do you think Dan Marino fell in the draft all the way down yeah. to Miami when he was coming out? Yep. Yep. Talking with Solomon Wilcox, joining the Orange and Black Insider courtesy of Pro Football Focus. Obviously, you know him being a former defensive back with the Cincinnati Bengals. And he is an ever present uh, media face in the NFL. Happy to have him join us talking some Bengals football, some PFF. Uh, you know, Solomon, um, when when you obviously it's kind of a foregone conclusion that the Bengals are probably going to be drafting Joe Burrow number one overall. I, I guess I've got kind of a two pronged question for you here. How how close do you think the Bengals are to an immediate turnaround? And who are some of the players that you think? fit the Bengals well, either from from a free agency perspective or a draft perspective, even if that's from a, you know, if you want to use PFF analytics on that front, feel free. But um, I guess how much work do the Bengals have to do and who are some of the names that we should be looking out for? Well, I, I could just tell you that some of the big time names, say if you had an edge rusher, one everyone wants is Yannick Ngakwe. Um, now, listen, the Jacksonville Jaguars look like they're going to put the franchise tag on them, and rightfully so. This is a guy who was a third-round pick in 2016, the same draft that gave us Joey Bosa, but yet and still this guy ranks up there in terms of total pressure, total sacks, you know, everything you need to hit, hurry, and harass him, quarterback, he ranks right up there with Joey Bosa, who I think was the second overall mm -hmm. player taken in the draft that year. And Yannick Ngakwe is producing at that same level as a third, a former third round pick. So Jaguars have gotten great value out of that player. And he is going to command a lot of money on the market. And if Jaguars, they haven't been able to sign him. So mm -hmm. it looks like uh, they're going to put the full tag on him. Um, I think if you're looking for linebackers, the guy that grades really high is a poor man's Luke Chukling 
And Joe Silver will sign a good contract of the Cleveland Browns. He's good in terms of run defense, good in coverage. The linebackers that people want today are guys who can stay on the field and play three downs, but still have the mind of a coach. Corey Littleton, he is um, really the ideal linebacker. Yeah. Okay, This is what everybody is seeing in Isaiah Simmons, who's bigger, stronger, faster than a Corey Littleton, who's, who's been with the Los Angeles Rams, a cover linebacker who can run with tight ends, who can run with running backs, who could even play against receivers. That's what people are looking for. And so Corey Littleton would, would, would help you out there. People aren't going to go into the free agent market looking for receivers. At least I don't think you should because this draft is stock full yeah. of talented young receivers who come much deeper than receivers in free agency. So, you know, I think the Bengals, for me, I think where they need to improve, if you know you're going to draft Joe Burrow, all assets have to go in on the offensive line. <laughs> and just playing to the because the Bengals are okay in the backfield with Giovanni Bernard, Joe Vicky. They're good at even tight ends. They're good at receivers as long as AJ Green is healthy a part of the group. They'll be fine. They've got they've got talent, but you cannot play this game if you don't have an offensive line. And that's what Andy Dalton ran into last year. It was woeful. It was really it was really bad. But they can infuse this offensive line with talent via free agency and through the draft. And they've got to do it in, in, in a quick fashion, and in a hurry, because if Joe Burrow is going to show up, you've got to be able to protect him. So you touched on the wide receiver depth in this year's draft class, Solomon, and you, uh, you know, you you've got the Bengals talking about how they want AJ Green in the long term plans. You you brought him up just a second ago. Do you think it's the right move to spend quite a bit of money? On him, on him to remain with the Bengals. I mean, on one hand, you've got the veteran star receiver that you can help prop up your rookie quarterback with, but it, on the other hand, you're paying a guy on the wrong side of 30 with a couple of big injuries the past couple of years. Yeah, yeah that's very true. But let's ask ourselves, you think the Arizona Cardinals are doing the right thing by continuing to bring back Larry Fitzgerald? Just, just ask yourself that question. The kind of guy he is, the presence he has in the locker room, and, and you know, with all the things that he gives you, he's not as productive as he used to be. But when you can work with young players and still go out and play and play hard, don't get me wrong. I mean, they would love for AJ to stay healthy. We know when he's healthy, he's a feared and talented wide receiver, and so you you have to hope that he stays healthy. But I think he's worth every penny, and he has, I think, shown us that he has a wonderful temperament. He does a good job of just coming to work, being a great example to what you want your best players to be within your franchise. And I think that's forward thinking. And I think Cincinnati Bengals have gotten it right. They want to keep AJ Green around. Yeah, and uh, it sounds like they're going to be making that move here. We're talking with Solomon Wilcott's going to spend another minute with him. Uh, he is joining the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast courtesy of Pro Football Focus. Solomon, you were just kind of changing gears a little bit. You were part of some of the most fun and innovative NFL teams, Bengals teams, uh, at the time. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I don't I don't know if you have a specific entertaining story to maybe bring us behind the, the Bengals curtain a little bit, whether it's about old Paul Brown or um, maybe some of the high-profile characters that were on some of the teams that you were. But we've got some fans that listen to this podcast that both remember you as a player, but also some on the younger side that didn't experience those teams that you were on. Uh, I don't know if you got a fun little story or anecdote that you want to share with us, but we'd love to hear it. Well, I, I can tell you about the birth of the Dickie Shuffle. Okay. I remember, and, you know, this is kind of – he was doing the stands, he was practicing it, and so myself, him, and Eric Thomas, we were really close, we spent a lot of time together, that was his rookie year, that was our second year in the league, um, and so if he's doing it, I said, oh man, please tell me you're not going to do that again. I said, dude, if you do that, that is the, that is the worst dance I've ever seen, come on, I was like, dude, you got, you know, so I'm killing him, just killing him, until so, he went out and did it. I think we were playing the Jets. He did it. He was all over the place with it. And then I said, okay, we got to help you out. He started refining it. And then he, he, we were in the uh, clubhouse. We were in the 
locker room before the game. And so here comes Paul Brown, the legendary Paul Brown. Comes over, he says, hey, come here. He says, I remember he leaned in and he says, you know that dance you do? I'm not that fond of it, but my wife likes it. <laughs> Keep doing it. And then he said, Keep doing it. <laughs> we all could have been floored. You could have knocked us all over with a feather. <laughs> because God damn, Paul Brown was over school. He said, huh? He was, just, he was the one that said, Act like you've been there before. Slip mm-hmm. the ball to the assistant. He was the one to coin the phrase. Act like you've been there before. No, mm-hmm. In other words, no antics. We don't need all that dancing. No jumping around. No spiking. It. That, I mean, this is coming from the godfather of the NFL. And so he said we were slower. Oh, my God. And after that, he just ran with it. And then he, you know, they think, this rule where you couldn't do it in the end zone, you had to do it over at the bench. So he brought the secondary members in, of course, me and Eric Thomas, Louis Phillips, the the and they're all doing it. And that guy is still making a living off that dance. So it tells you <laughs> that if you're getting ready to create a dance, don't come to me because I don't know anything about what I'm talking about because I, I could not have been more wrong. <laughs> Well, it was uh it's obviously an iconic uh dance or part of, of Bengals history and that's that's a really <laughs> it's a really funny story. I'm glad you shared that with us. I have to say this, yeah, as I mentioned, you were part of some of the most entertaining and successful Bengals teams in uh in team history. I, I would be remiss and my, my older brother would kick my butt if I didn't bring this up to you. I told him I was interviewing you. Uh, he's a he's a longtime Bengals fan. He played high school football, and he specifically uh, selected the jersey number forty one because you were his favorite player. So I got to give my brother a shout out and give you a shout out um, because he specifically said you got to tell him that. <laughs> well, you tell him that he has excellent taste. And I <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. I will do that. I will do that. I'm sure he'll listen to the interview as well. Um, thanks for your time, Solomon. Uh, once again, if you could kind of tell us a little bit about maybe what you're doing with Pro Football Focus, how folks can um, you know get get an account there and get in with all the metrics that really teams are using, scouts are using, fans are using across uh, the nation with the NFL. That's right. You know, we sell a lot of our products to all 32 NFL teams. They use our data um, to enhance what they do, to create efficiencies for evaluation of players and to study their upcoming opponents for game planning. You too can get some of the same kind of content to learn more about NFL players, to learn more about your teams, to learn more about the players in the draft, whether you're a fantasy, whether you're a gamer. Um, or whether you just want to enjoy the game, know that we grade every single player on every single play, and then we crunch all of that data to create wonderful content. All you got to do is go to pff.com. You can read many of our articles there. You can also subscribe. You can go to our YouTube channel and get um, watch the videos that we do, and you get even more information. You can see the players' grades and how the teams and players are doing each and every week when they play games in the National Football League. So go to pff.com if you want to learn more about it. But I appreciate you giving me the time to do that. Well, I appreciate you making the time to come on our program. We would love to have you on again. I know it's a very busy time of year, especially what's coming up over the next month, month and a half. Um, But uh, we'd love to catch up with you again, maybe when things slow down a little bit more and we can kind of digest what the Bengals did over the offseason if you are willing and able. Definitely we'll be able to do that, Anthony. You just give me a call and we'll make it happen. Okay? So, sounds great. Thanks again for the time, Solomon. All the best. All right, you as well. That was Solomon Wilcots, uh, former Bengals defensive back, joining us courtesy of Pro Football Focus. Some of you who uh, are watching this interview live, we had a an earlier time slate uh, set aside for – Solomon to join us. Uh, He got caught up with some things, but he, you know, very graciously ended up still calling in when he had the time and made the time to be on the program. So very ecstatic that he was uh, part of part of the program. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview as well. We have yet we've never had him on the show before. Uh, We've had other pro football focus guys on here, but uh, obviously not a guy who has played for the Bengals and has been such an ever present 
media face for the NFL. So very excited to have him on the program. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will be having our standard Wednesday night show. For those of you tuning in live, we will be having that show uh, again tomorrow. So, uh, you know, this will probably be its own standalone audio and then we'll probably connect it to that episode as well. But uh, we wanted to make sure that we carved out some time for uh, Solomon Wilcots, who joined us courtesy of Pro Football Focus. Thanks so much for all of you joining us live. Make sure to tune into our weekly show again tomorrow and all of the other content that we have on cincyjungle.com and the Orange and Black Insider. In case you're new to the program, you can get this show. We simultaneously stream on our YouTube channel, Orange and Black Insider, as well as on uh, the Cincy Jungle Facebook page, which many of you are joining us from each. And uh, you can get this show if you are a podcast person and like to listen to the audio after. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play. We're on iHeartRadio, and like I mentioned, uh, YouTube, all kinds of different platforms. So get the show how you can. Leave us a rating. Hopefully you enjoyed this interview, and uh, we'll bring you more. We've got more coming up. I do have to say, as we close out here, we did bring on an associate producer uh, helping us land some more of these interviews, and he was directly responsible for landing this one. So James Clayton, uh, C-L-A-Y-D-O-N, James Clayton has... Uh, helped us out, graciously did the legwork to book Solomon Wilcots joining us here. And, uh, you know, I, I can't thank him enough for that. He's also working on some others. I don't want to say that yet until we have those, those particular people booked, but he is working behind the scenes for others. So thank you, James. Uh, poor guy got about 28 emails from me over the past 24 hours about this. So he really, really came through on that. So thank you to our associate producer, James Clayton, for landing this interview. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. This has been the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. Our thanks to Solomon Wilcots and Pro Football Focus for the time. We'll see you on our weekly episode.